charged up for an electrifying episode of Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry? Well, I am. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to episode number 536 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. My guest this week is Bryce Yonker, Executive Director of Grid Forward, an industry association dedicated to electric grid modernization through advanced technology, policy progress, and business innovation. Bryce and I are chatting all about Grid Forward's mission, their main activities, the variety of members involved in this organization, and why they chose to schedule their EV Grid Symposium at the same time as this year's FIA Formula E World Championship. Also this week, keeping with our electrifying theme, I check out a new in-road inductive charging system located in northern Italy, developed by car maker Stellantis. But first, let's bring in Bryce from Grid Forward. Hi, Bryce. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, glad to be on. So, Bryce, we're talking about the modernization of the electrical grid and how Grid Forward is helping achieve this. But before we talk specifically about Grid Forward, why is an organization focused on grid modernization hosting an event on EVs? And what is the coming role for EVs in relation to the grid? Yeah, we're really excited to have the gathering focused on electric vehicles because the opportunity at hand for grid operators with incoming significant amounts of electric vehicles is a game changer. So utilities have adopted very effectively so many generations of new technology solutions, which in some ways electric vehicles aren't a ton different, but in some ways they are. These loads are significant amounts coming on at each location. And so there's technical challenges and opportunities overall as they come online. So from the challenge standpoint, Utilities have to be able to know what's the impact of these connections going to be on their systems down to the very edge of what they're running. And from an opportunity standpoint, this is a significant amount of of load. This lends itself the possibility for a utility to have growth. (laughs) And in many communities, they have not had load growth for some time. While they transition their model in many instances, they get to figure out a pathway to adopt new technologies that effectively allow them to integrate these resources. But at the same time, the load growth opportunity lends themselves a huge potential for making just the general nuts and bolts investments that are necessary to effectively run an energy system. Absolutely. So tell me more about Grid Forward and your mission and your main activities and why the industry needs an organization like yours. Yep. Grid Forward, we're an industry trade organization focused on driving modernization ahead. We have our roots starting back at the last time the feds were significantly investing in this topic, the ARRA days that I'm sure your listeners know quite well. After a couple iterations, we landed on our current name, Grid Forward, and primarily we're working in the West to help move modernization ahead, help those utilities roll out the sort of advanced technologies that they need to use. We like to say a toolbox, a toolkit is very ready now. Let's deploy it. Let's get it in use. Let's put it in commercial installations. And let's just find a way to run our systems more effectively by leveraging the advanced technology solutions that are available now. So your organization has a wide variety of members. Tell me about these different kinds of members involved in grid modernization. Yep, Grid Forward members are distribution utilities. Most folks rightfully so think of them as the first line wave of defense for deploying modernization. So those are a key member community with ours. Another key member community is the tech companies that are providing these utilities, the advanced solutions. These are monitoring, metering, analytics. It's the whole wave of solutions that are helping provide better visibility, situational awareness, and ultimately control of our energy system. But beyond that, we have a pretty broad tent. So there's national labs, there's investors that are not putting ratepayer capital to work. There's nonprofit entities and state agencies. It's a big tent, right? To move modernization forward, to make it a reality in today's world, 
we need a lot of hands helping and a lot of folks rowing in the same direction. And so we very openly invite all of them into our membership. And it takes that diversity of stakeholders to move these pretty significant investments forward in an effective fashion. Absolutely. So let's talk about your interest in the FIA Formula E World Championship. So why did you guys choose to schedule your EV grid symposium to coincide with this race? Yeah, we often try to do our annual meeting next to another event. This year, we decided to play a little bit of a fun card and do it next to that race. Portland's home base for me. Portland's a place we've known so many of the stakeholders really since the founding of our organization. So it's kind of home turf for us. So we felt like it was too good of an opportunity not to do an industry event next to it. So we're going to leverage that really unique experience to have people have a really professional conversation. A lot of the times these things are in convention centers. I was just in one yesterday, which is fine. But if we can have a productive conversation and do some networking in a little bit more of a unique fashion, we felt like, let's do that. I'm not a Formula E or a Formula One enthusiast, so I'm really excited to have my first opportunity to see this race and see what this is all about. The performance of these vehicles, as I understand it, it's really phenomenal. So I think we'll all be able to see that firsthand. I mean, I've test drove a number of electric vehicles, but I haven't seen them performing in a racing circuit before. So that's what we're really excited about, is we know that the opportunity for electrified transportation is really exciting for our planet, for the climate, for a lot of the communities that we're working in, for a lot of individuals who are deciding to make that transition themselves. So seeing these things in a racing environment was something that we were excited to do. Excellent. Okay, one last question for you before we hit the off the cuff. Now, what's the future look like for you guys? What kind of plans do you guys have at Grid Forward? Well, I can't get too much into some details on an idea that is adjacent to this topic for funding for next cycle, but that's where I will take your question. The federal agencies right now are spending unprecedented amounts of information to support transition in energy systems and advanced capabilities of the grid. We're spending a lot of time to help support the industry on understanding that. So just today, actually, we put out a notice to our community about an announcement that happened yesterday. And this is a good example of how much money are we talking about? The U.S. Department of Agriculture, of all places, has over $10 billion that is going to be made available to electric co-ops across this country to help them transition clean energy resources and advance their energy systems. $10 billion for co-ops. So it's super, super exciting to see that the federal agencies are really rolling up their sleeves to try to help support energy transition across this country. We've got a couple of submissions that we're very hopeful that come through for the grid deployment office at U.S. Department of Energy. They're rolling out a number of their programs. We've got a session next month with Treasury because those updated tax incentive payments are a really big deal. It's just game on time right now for the industry to be using and taking advantage of these funding opportunities. We're super excited to see about what's in motion and the impact that it's going to have. That's probably the first idea I have to mind. Hopefully, we'll have a few submissions coming in in future cycles for stakeholders to get a part of some pretty exciting teams deploying some advanced solutions. But the first to mind is that response. And check out the USDA site if people are interested, especially if they're working with co-ops, because that one's a a really big deal. Excellent. That is exciting. All right, Bryce, it's time for your off-the-cuff question. Now, since you haven't been on my show before, you get my standard off-the-cuff. So, Bryce, if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there, the restaurant is closed, what would you have? Oh, boy. I like a lot of different types of food. My favorite restaurant in Portland, unfortunately, closed. They couldn't make it through all the transition these last few years. So the tapas at that Spanish restaurant was probably one of my favorites. I did have the chance to enjoy it in its original locations in Spain, and they did not disappoint. Walking the streets of San Sebastian uh, with our kids last year and just dropping into all the tapas restaurants. And boy, that was really fun. The food's good, but the experience probably makes it more so than anything. So that's the first one to mind. That sounds lovely. (laughs) Excellent, Bryce. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me on. So what about that in-road inductive charging I talked about earlier? Well, let me introduce you to the arena of the future. 
a 0.65 mile loop of road embedded with EV charging coils under the surface, located near the Chiari exit of the A35 motorway, which is about a half an hour outside of Milan, and is the brainchild of the world's fifth largest automaker, Stellantis, which is the parent company of Fiat, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Peugeot, Ram, Maserati, and a whole lot more. At the heart of this arena of the future is the Stellantis Dynamic Wireless Power Transfer, or DWPT, technology. In order for this technology to work, small grooves were cut into the surface of the road. In those grooves, semi-flat inductive coils were placed and then connected to a power supply. And then finally, asphalt was poured over that. When the coils are active, power is sent to the vehicles via an embedded receiver. So the power goes straight to the battery, right? Actually, no. This dynamic wireless power transfer system actually sends power straight to the car's electric motor. This way, EVs can cruise along this loop at high speeds without affecting the charge of the battery at all. Initial tests are quite promising. Stellantis says that the power transfer efficiency is comparable to the typical efficiency of fast charging stations. They also contend that the magnetic fields involved in this system pose no danger to pedestrians or drivers or their passengers. Importantly, because DWPT runs on DC, that means that the associated cabling can be relatively thin and compact and can be directly connected to renewable energy sources without the need to convert back and forth from AC. So is DWPT ready for prime time? Will we see it being used in major highways across the USA anytime soon? Absolutely not. (laughs) But it works. So that's a start, right? Stellantis says the technology, in quotes, attracts interest for commercial development globally because it can also be built into static EV charging stations, parking lots, airports, and the like. And the future for this type of technology could be quite promising. So, if you want even more information about the arena of the future, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the YouTube description for this week's episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on that podcasting platform of your choice. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck, you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of June 16th, 2023, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>